John Fitzgerald was born in 1882 in Drayton, Ontario, and as a teenager apprenticed in his father's rural drugstore. Interestingly, his mother seems to have been a chronic invalid, so he would have had these dual influences on him very early on. He was a very bright, sensitive kid. So on the one hand, he has his sick mother at home, and on the other hand, he has his father in the apothecary shop making patent medicines, which in the 1890s were not terribly effective. So I think he got you know, quite uh, the seed planted early in his brain about what can I do to uh, improve the health system. Fitzgerald entered the University of Toronto Medical School at the age of 16. After interning, his interest in psychology led him to accept a position as pathologist and clinical director of the Toronto Asylum for the Insane, but he was already having doubts about his chosen path. I think gradually, after five years of psychiatry, he realized that that wasn't um, he, that he couldn't really affect any change in the asylums. There were people that were mad and he couldn't do anything about it. And it was an awful, awful scenes there. So he shifts into public health and when he's still a young man, still in his 20s. Fitzgerald spent three years studying bacteriology in Europe and the United States. When he returned to Canada in 1913, he was ready to begin his life's work. At this point, Canadian children were dying of diphtheria like flies and they had to rely on imported American antitoxins, which were prohibitively expensive. So kids were dying, you know, horrendous deaths, and it was, it was because they couldn't afford the medicine. So my grandfather thought this was appalling, and uh, he just said, uh, I can make this uh, medicine myself here because I now have the expertise, and he was the only man in Canada really who had it at that point. He approached the University of Toronto with the idea, which they only reluctantly agreed to consider. Impatient, as always, he built a stable on Barton Street with money from his wife's inheritance, and while he waited for the university's decision, started producing diphtheria antitoxin. Antitoxin was made with horses. Basically, you inject toxin, diphtheria toxin, very small amounts, but more and more and more over time. The horses respond in the immune system. It doesn't hurt the horses. And after a period of time, you bleed them, you bleed off some. Again, that doesn't hurt the horses. And from there, you, you siphon off the, site, the serum part, and that's the antitoxin, and that's processed into the antitoxin. His success convinced the university of the soundness of his proposal, and the University of Toronto Antitoxin Laboratory was established on May 1, 1914. With the outbreak of World War I, demand for vaccine quickly exceeded the capacity of the basement lab. Albert Goodrum, a wealthy distiller, donated farmland 12 miles north of the university, as well as the money for the buildings. The new facility was named Connaught Laboratories, after Canada's Governor General, the Duke of Connaught. The war was followed by the most deadly flu epidemic in history, and then the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best. Because of Fitzgerald's prescience and determination, the lab was equal to each of these challenges. In little less than a decade, Connaught became world leader in vaccine production. His vision was, was unique. What he built with Connaught and the school, but Connaught specifically, was distinctive. But this operation was based on its sales, proceeds of its sales, which were kept at the lowest possible price, and their main client the customer were provincial governments across the country who then distributed the products for free. I mean, we could have ended up with a system like the States, you know, very local based, very private based, you know, I mean, that works on a certain level, but his, his vision was very Canadian. And our, the roots of our system start with him. Fitzgerald's reputation was enhanced even further when his success with Connaught convinced John D. Rockefeller Jr. to donate $1.25 million for a school of hygiene at the University of Toronto, only the third such institution to be established and the first outside the United States. By the 1930s, Fitzgerald was recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities on public health, but his obsessive drive to defeat disease was beginning to take its toll. Exhausted by decades of overwork and racked by insomnia, migraines, and ulcers, he made his first suicide attempt in 1939. 
Dr. John G. Fitzgerald died by his own hand on June 20, 1940, his depression convincing him that his life had been a failure. Nothing could be further from the truth. The lab he started in that stable on Barton Street has saved untold millions of lives during the 20th century through the production and distribution of insulin, penicillin, and salt polio vaccine, through its leading role in the control of diphtheria, and through its tremendous contributions in the eradication of smallpox. Today, Connaught is Avantis Pasteur Canada, a division of one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. But nine decades after convincing the University of Toronto that homegrown vaccines might be a good idea, Dr. Fitzgerald's vision, his pioneering spirit, and his drive to innovate are as present as ever. I think it's very fitting that on our 90th anniversary, this is the year that Dr. John Fitzgerald is inducted in the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. It's a very concrete realization of what he created, the work that he did. And there is a legacy. His legacy is the contributions to public health that the men and women of this company here in Canada and around the world continue to make.